we're going to be reading from the eighth book of Israel, Persecuted But Not Forsaken, and this is the part one of the of the eighth, eighth book. Uh, we're going to be covering chapter 8, and the title of that chapter is Come Out from Among Them and Be You Separate. Touch Not the Unclean. Uh, number two, All Nations Are Now Set Up for Nuclear War and Starvation. And uh, we, we actually see that in the making at this point. Now, as I was preparing um, for this class, and I was reading through it, one of the things that um, came through from what I could see here is how Pasta defends Yahweh. And that's something that we can be really pleased about uh, and, and think about the fact that everybody, every religion in the world is trying to give some excuses why they don't obey Yahweh, why they don't keep his laws. And everyone has their own Set of, set of laws that they don't like. But here we have Pastor Israel Hawkins, the defender of Yahweh. Think about it like that. Um, in, in Isaiah 49, verse 3, it says, And he said to me, You are my servant, O Israel, through whom I will be glorified. And that's, what, that's one of the things Pastor purposes to do, is to glorify Yahweh. Show the greatness of his laws and how by not keeping them, we're, we're incurring curses in the world. And that message is is the one that we have been, that the house of Yahweh have been, been preaching for some time. And it's beginning to get through. It's beginning to get through. Well, Pastor starts off here um, uh, with shalom to everyone and, and, and praising and laughing and uh, rejoicing. In verse 2, it says, I don't know if, you, if everyone has one of these or not. And he was showing the... Um, Oki 24 manual, and um, and he actually starts out the, the this sermon with talking about tones, our tones as we speak to each other. But um, he referenced the Oki 24 manual, and um, in the Oki 24 uh, manual is a lot of um, teaching that we can use to discipline children into a certain spirit, okay, of serving and um, of being respectful. Uh, and if done consistently and in the right manner, these things will be indelibly written on the hearts and minds of our children. Even if it seems as if they are rejecting it at some point, okay? Um, later on, it will come back, and they, they will have nothing but that to come back to. You see, that's why it's very important to be diligent with our teaching. He says in verse 3, I was talking to some people about some things that I need to overcome, and they said, well, you wrote this stuff. And I said, it helps to rehearse it. Believe me, it helps to rehearse it. And that just shows you the humility that, that um, uh, we see here with Pasta. Uh, it goes on, 
verse 4. Um, this is what I'm working on, but tones. Um, he's reading from verse, I mean, chapter, page 3 of the book. But tones and what they can imply. We really need to catch or to watch ourselves closely. We need to give Yahweh thanks for all things that he's doing. And he is guiding this stuff. Uh, that's interesting. Oh. Book eight, part one. Book eight, part one. Hmm. Let's see. <laughs> I think I. Okay, so we made a mistake here. We're, we're going to be going through a different chapter. Chapter 18. Not chapter 8. I... Okay, chapter 18. So the title on this one is, Yahweh's last day's work must be according to prophecy. As... The Savior's work was according to prophecy. Uh, number three, Yahweh's Sabbaths will be accepted in the last days, worship of Yahweh, and the nations will be judged. And this was um, Feast of Unleavened Bread, 42408. <clears throat> so we... Pastor opens up here with applause and he said, the world is going green. You may be seated. Um, verse 2, I was told to tell you that you need this, you need this book. And the book is what the feast means to you. This was... The original, I think. It was my first book, uh, booklet. The first book that we wrote, <clears throat> that we wrote on it, uh, too big to get in that, what Yahweh's feast mean to you. Now it says, this is friendly. Uh, now it says, this is, is friendly for children up to seven years old. Uh, I guess it becomes unfriendly. <laughs> well, you know what he's saying. Each paragraph is written in a pleasant rhythm format uh, or, or grasp the atten to, to grasp the attention of our young readers and to help them better understand the message. So you can actually read this to your children or uh, let them read themselves and they'll understand it faster than the earlier versions. It was very simplified <clears throat> back then. I still am, I'm still an Oki and very uh, simplified, okay? Now, one of the things about the feast days that um, is so... Um, interesting, and oftentimes I think about Christians, right? Um, and their objections to the feast, the various feast days. And they always cite Yeshua Messiah coming and doing away with 
the feast. You know, they, they, they associate the feast with sacrifices and sacrifices were ended. And um, uh, so the feast was ended. Okay. Now, um, it's very easy to talk to like a seven days Adventist who recognize that, okay, the Sabbath is to be kept. And at the same time, they do away with all the other feasts. And the simple thing is just to point out that sacrifices was done on the Sabbath too. <laughs> so they have a struggle right there. But if you realize this, that the feast days, including the Sabbath, are all summaries of the plan of Yahweh. If you think about it, okay, the week ending with the Sabbath tells us a story in and of itself, six days given to man, and then the seventh day is Yahweh's, okay? And that, in summary, is the plan that Yahweh has for mankind, okay? But if you go and look at the feast days now, you will see a more detailed analysis of Yahweh's plan, okay? And um, uh, I don't want to go through it at this point, but it's, it's very clear, okay, that, that Yahweh outlined the details of his plan, um, beginning with the, the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. Think about that, which actually came before any of the feast days started, okay? And since the feast days have this message in it, have the, you know, um, demonstrates the, the, the plan of Yahweh, well, what they're doing is eliminating the plans of Yahweh. You see? <clears throat> um, and just to think about it, uh, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, think about this. Has it been fully fulfilled yet? Would you say the Feast of Unleavened Bread has been fully fulfilled? No, you can't say it. Okay? At the end of Yahweh's plan, it will be fully fulfilled because sin will be removed. <clears throat> well, in verse 4 here, it says, I don't want to read any articles today. I want to get right into this, where we uh, left off yesterday. And hopefully, everyone will, be, will pay close attention. Don't let anyone interrupt you. If they, if they come near you, tell them, get away from me. Get away from me. <laughs> um. So, hold up your, your hand, I'll stop, and we'll run, run, uh, run them off. You can be turning back over to Matithia 12. There's a lot on the news about the food now, food rationing. I don't know if, if we could still get in another order from Walton's, Walton's but uh, we might try that. They have a lot of stuff. And it's already pack, packed in buckets, and you can store it in your bath, in your bathroom, or whatever. That might not be the best place after thinking about it. Okay, on on Matitha twelve now, and we notice that he tells us not to make this known. Now I'll read you the corrected version for this. The way the world authorities say that it must be translated today, um, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, but he warned them in verse 16, warned them not to make this. It's not a hymn, even though they translated it that way. It's actually this not make this known. And the rest of all, uh, the rest of that sentence, verse 17, that it would be fulfilled. Not to make it known. So that this could be fulfilled. What was spoken through Isaiah the prophet? And then he gives you something there that's translated wrong and they took out some words. 
they actually took out Abel out of that and, and some names. They actually took out some names out of this, that sentence. But we have the history on it, and we also have the correct translation on it, according to the world's authoritative books. But notice, it's not to make it known, not to make it known, what known? Well, verse 18 shows you, uh, see, the past, the last part. Verse 18, he will bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. And of course, this has never been done. Yeshua didn't bring forth that judgment in his time period. Now, he's bringing it forth now under his or the last established house of Yahweh. This is important to understand. And it's amazing that we can understand these things here in the house of Yahweh. And it's just like, it will take probably a, a full year of explaining to explain this to somebody. <clears throat> um, but it, it shouldn't be so difficult. But what does that have to do with keeping the Sabbath? Because all of this has to do with keeping the Sabbath. As you notice, the whole subject is about the Sabbath. The Sabbath over here, and Yeshua was telling the Pharisees that, you know, he was trying to show them, trying to teach them the Sabbath, trying to teach them to read and pay attention to what the prophets had spoken. And, and, and this is what we do here today as well what the prophets have spoken. Let's go back to understand this. It's, let's go back to Exodus 20, and the subject here is the Sabbath. Exodus 20, verse 20, he said, Moshe said to the people, do not fear, for Yahweh has come to test you. And um, in the chapter 8 that I was reading from before, um, he, he, he was saying to be thankful for what the things that Yahweh provide. And I wanted to make a comment at that point. Um, even the test is something that we have to thank Father Yahweh for. You see? Because I think about Matithia 25, the, the wise and the foolish virgins, and if you notice, at a certain point, it says that the foolish virgins had to go out to buy some more oil. And when you think about going to school, when you're going to college, they have tests set up for you throughout the year and throughout the four years that you'll be in college. And those tests have been set up to establish whether or not you know what you're supposed to know. And they cost something. You see? So these are not things to brush aside or try to, you know, deal with them outside the law. So continuing here, it says, well, that word test there it actually means to judge, to put tests in front of you, put his laws in front of you, and actually judge to see if you would keep them. And situations also. In verse 13, to test and prove you so that the reverence of Yahweh will be with you so that you do not commit sin. And if the reverence of Yahweh is with you, with me, you'll hate sin. So the things that he's giving his people here is a teaching, teaching them the laws so they can turn from sin. But he's judging them. He's judging them 
and proving whether they actually are turning from sin, be turning over to um, Deuteronomy 12, whether they will keep the laws or not. And of course, that is true with each generation. Book 2 teaches the same thing, that we must that we must be proven, that we must prove ourselves to Yahweh, that we must repent, be converted, so our sins will be blotted out. That's how it works. And of course, you can repent with your mouth or express repentance with your mouth, but Yahweh judges the heart. And he says, people draw near to me with their mouth but their hearts are far from me. And we read yesterday where he actually judges the secret things of our heart. Things that we don't want to acknowledge. Here in Deuteronomy 12 verse 1 now, notice these are the statutes and judgments, the laws which you must observe. You must observe. You must observe to do them or as First Yachanan 1 verse 7 says, Let no man deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. I think that should be First Yachanan 3 verse 7. If you look up that word practice, it's several places throughout the scriptures that you have got to practice the laws. And of course, he says here, these are my statutes and my judgments, the laws which you must do. You must do them. We must do them, brethren. We must keep these laws. The world is waiting for us. They are, they are totally confused at this point. They're confused. They can't work together, even if it means to prevent death. They can't work together. We have to be able to work together. You see, that's, that's what Yahweh is wanting us to do. And of course, the world comes along, the preachers come along, and they say the laws are done away with, that Yeshua did away with them. He calls them liars. And of course, Yachanan calls them a liar. First Yachanan 2 verse 4. says, he that says, I know him and keeps not his commandments or his laws is a liar and the truth is not in him. We want the truth to be in us. But through deception, they have deceived the world into thinking that they can break these laws and of course, still receive salvation eternal life. This is not true according to the scriptures. There is no scripture in the book of Yahweh that teaches, that states such a thing. And the world is listening to the house of Yahweh. The world is listening to the house of Yahweh and this, this, this rock that was formed out of thin air and is is, is now striking this image on its feet. Understand what your feet is. Your foundation is what you stand on. So all of what they stand on is going to be swept away. And then this kingdom that is so small here on the earth will grow and cover the earth. You see? That's what's in store for us. Verse 18, the same teaching goes from Genesis 1 clear to Revelation 22. And in the first chapter of Genesis, it says, it plainly shows you there, you there that you cannot partake of evil and live. Can't. Revelation 22 the last chapter in your Bible, the last chapter of Revelation says you cannot 
partake of evil and live. And everybody want rights. Think about it. That's what Revelation talk about, a right, right to the tree of life. Everybody want rights. And here are the Christians. Christians, if you're listening, you are making a big deal about this, the, the destruction of the Constitution. But what did you do with Yahweh's laws? You are, you're claiming that they were destroyed. Think about it. The laws of Yahweh are way more important than the Constitution. Is Yahweh going to give up on his laws? I don't think so. You've got to practice righteousness and become perfect and be like your father, your heavenly father, which is in uh, Deuteronomy 12, verse, verse 1, verse 2. He says, you must utterly destroy all the places where the nations you have driven out uh, worship their gods on high, on high mountains. And we're going to be teaching them how to get out of this God worship that they, they find themselves in. You see? And they're going to see that this is the right way. This is the only way that we can live and have peace. Think about it. You can't have peace without the laws of Yahweh. There is no way. So it says, you must utterly destroy, well, I think I read that. That is the lifted up places on the hills and under every spreading tree. Well, of course, that's what Yahweh's kingdom will do eventually, is wipe out God worship. See? And the Christians don't understand. They think they are actually worshiping Yahweh when they worship God. It's not so, my friends. It's not so. Think about it. Well, I think that's all the time I have. So, I'd like to welcome to the stage our next priest, the great Khan Bitzel. Shalom, everyone. We appreciate you tuning in this evening to the Sabbath evening law class. I'd like to go back uh, to the title of this lesson this evening, the eighth book of Israel in chapter 18. Yahweh's last wor day's work must be according to prophecy, as the Savior's work was according to prophecy. So here we see two conditions. And a third condition is Yahweh's Sabbath will be accepted and I'd like to suggest three other words to help fill in this meaning. Yahweh's Sabbaths will be acceptable, recognized, and observed. So Yahweh has set rules and laws to govern his plan and his people that form his house in the last days, according to prophecy. And as the Kaham before me stated, that Yahweh will not be worshipped in the way that the gods are worshipped, in the way that the people of this world have gone after uh, other um, religious leaders, other uh, philosophies, other teachings. He set statutes and judgments and laws to govern his house, and at his house, we will be receiving those who are seeking Yahweh's laws to, to uh, work uh, on their overcoming, their negative character, work on uh, developing positive character in their lives, so that, and they can do this by keeping the feasts. Yahweh said to seek the habitation of your heavenly Father, who is Yahweh, 
the house of Yahweh, and the place which Yahweh your father shall choose out of all your tribes to establish his name. And when you go there, you are to bring your tithes and your offerings, your free will offerings, and these are to support the work of Yahweh, which is the most important work on all the face of the earth, because without it, without the fulfillment of the plan of Yahweh for mankind, none of the other corporations, the businesses, none of the uh, the works of man's hands will survive the destruction that is coming as a result of forgetting Yahweh's laws of peace. And at his house, you will find the priests which are established in his house to teach the laws and to uh, to guard and protect Yahweh's house and his people from the curses that come as a result of breaking Yahweh's laws. And a very important point was brought up previously uh, about the, the Passover and the prophecies concerning the Passover and Yahshua and how they have yet to be fulfilled. And that's a really great point uh, that we can really pay attention to in all the scriptures that we read, which of these have been fulfilled and which have yet to be fulfilled. And that will clue you in right there to how much work we have yet to do in this time period that the, the house of Yahweh has been established. We're going to pick up here on page 208, verse 60. Now, whether it's studying or training or to be a teacher or teaching or whatever Yahweh assigns you to do, that is what you're supposed to be doing on his holy convocations. Yahweh set apart his Sabbath with uh, governing laws and rules. Uh, we keep the Sabbath from the setting of the sun uh, this evening until the setting of the sun tomorrow evening on the seventh day of the week, as Yahweh has established it. Now, there's a particular way that the Sabbath must be kept, and that is something that has been restored. The knowledge has been restored to Yahweh's house in the last days. Uh, there's many who strive to keep the Sabbath according to the Scripture. They see that the seventh day, uh, they figure that out, and they've chosen to follow that in, in their lives. But the other thing we've learned is that Yahweh always sets a teacher over the different eras of the house of Yahweh. And those teachers, with the inspiration, and by inspiration, it's something that is put in a person that drives them uh, to uphold Yahweh and not to bend to um, the influences or the deception of the ones who oppose Yahweh primarily, which is uh, Lucifer, who turned against Yahweh uh, in the beginning and started opposing Yahweh's plan. But Yahweh even has used that in order to build the character of mankind. That's the, the difficulties and the oppositions we work against. Uh, striving to keep and uphold Yahweh's laws despite uh, the, the trials and difficulties and the setbacks. We're in Deuteronomy uh, here, in Deuteronomy 16, and he picks up here in verse 11, bringing forth this idea of rejoicing. You shall rejoice in front of Yahweh. Now, this is coming before Yahweh on the appointments we have with Yahweh, his Sabbaths and feast days. The word rejoice is the Hebrew word in Strong, 6440. And it actually carries the idea of being in front of Yahweh or in the sanctuary. And this is why we gather at Yahweh's sanctuary. The, the building itself uh, would be nothing without the people. The people are the important part. They're the ones that carry out the, the work that Yahweh's given us to do 
of teaching this to others, those that Yahweh draws to his house and calls out at this time. So we rejoice in front of Yahweh, which is also part of the work. Um, you soon find, if you just sit around and do nothing, it becomes um, kind of a distasteful way of life. But when you can be active and productive and working and especially helping others and helping others overcome their problems and difficulties by providing skills, providing uh, knowledge, understanding, that's what really uh, gives life its flavor and enjoyment. Rejoicing, they say, is the greatest medicine there, that there is because it builds you up and it builds up your health. And, you know, when you're doing well, you tend to uh, convey that to others. So this has to do with your personal interactions with others. Now, if you go around with a sarcastic look on your face and sarcastic words coming out of your mouth, you know, not only are you going to cause those around you to feel uncomfortable, but you yourself do not display your best uh, character, your best qualities. You're teaching what Satan wants you to teach. That is to, to discourage and to uh, put others down and, and bring actually bring destruction. And if that's what you want to do then, you'll have no part or lot with me. And here, once again, Israel is upholding Yahweh because he knows that this is what Yahweh is um, developing in, he's developing a perfect righteous character in mankind that is that he is pleased to dwell with and and at peace with. We're we're looking forward to being a part of Yahweh's very household, uh, his family, and as we all know today, not all families run. Uh, according to peace and harmony. And when they don't, it causes a great deal of, of strife, strife and harm in society. And that's not pleasing to any, every, anyone. So what we can do is to train ourselves with the instruction that Yahweh gives us, and, and a great one for that is the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program, which we're all practicing and learning here, and with that, we can teach others joy and gladness and convey Yahweh's joy to them and make everyone joyful around us. So here we are in front of Yahweh. And remember, Yahweh is judging us here. He's judging us uh, from what comes forth from our heart, our true desires, what comes forth from our mouth, because that shows and reveals, you know, what we've been studying, what we've been practicing and working on. Yeshua said, from your words, you could be destroyed. So these are things which proceed from you as a person. Uh, as an individual, from me as my individual, what proceeds forth from me. That's what matters. That's what I must work on. You shall rejoice in front of Yahweh your Father because he is here at his house. His eyes and his heart are with you at this time. Now, the words eyes and heart, they convey two qualities here, the first being the quality of his eyes, being that of observation. Yahweh observes uh, what we do with what he has given us. It shows that he has regard, and it shows presence. In other words, Yahweh's attention is upon us, and his heart this is the center of wisdom, understanding, 
And it shows Yahweh's care and, again, his regard for his house. Remember, we're a very important part of his plan, bringing peace to mankind and to the whole universe. Your son, your daughter, your manservant, and your maidservant. So we see here that even our families are being taught this standard, a standard of perfection. At the place Yahweh, your father, chooses to establish his name. And where he establishes his name, that is where his authority is. That's what it mean, means to establish his name. It is, is establishing his authority. It's just like when we pray uh, in the name of Yahshua Messiah. We are praying through and by the authority that is vested in Yahshua Messiah from Yahweh. And you must remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and you must be careful to observe and do these statutes. The word observe, as in you must observe the Feast of Tabernacles, one of Yahweh's feasts. Keep, it means keep, guard, protect, save life. And this is what is done through the teaching and training in Yahweh's laws, teaching a person not to covet, not to steal, not to murder, not even with thoughts, but to conduct a moral life, to keep within bounds, to restrain. It also means to treasure. Now, a note on to keep within bounds and restrain, there's an idea, even from the Strongs, if you look at uh, observing a feast or, or rejoicing at the feast, it, there's an idea that uh, one would carry on in revelry and, and, and this party mentality, this party attitude. Well, that really does not align with scriptures, and as we have learned, this, the scriptures are learned line upon line, here a little and there a little, and also, as we're taught by our, our teacher who is inspired to teach these things, but that party attitude, just taking a vacation, it doesn't fit with the rest of the scriptures, such as observing the feast. To keep within bounds and to restrain, to treasure, to retain in memory. You know, so many drunken parties of the world, people don't even remember those. So this is an observance that is kept within the laws, within the bounds of Yahweh's laws, according to his laws, without drunkenness, without adultery and fornication, but kept with a pure mind something that is valued and retained in memory, something that you will watch for and anticipate and wait for. And each feast we recognize um, within the observance of that feast, we see a part of Yahweh's plan being rehearsed. And within that rehearsal is this idea of watching and waiting for the true, uh, the, the actual revelation of our Savior, Yahshua Messiah, who we will fulfill uh, the Passover with, and, you know, all of that that is encompassed in the, the completion of Yahweh's plan for this time period. And now it's, not, it's not the end of mankind, but it's the, the end of this part of the plan. And then what comes after, you know, Yahweh says our minds are not even capable of comprehending the things that he has in store for us. So you shall rejoice in righteous behavior at your feast, you and your, your families, uh, even those who work for you, In verse 15, seven days you shall, you must keep a joyous feast. 
And once again, uh, this word joyous comes from the idea of keeping and celebrating as sacred, you know, as holy or as set apart according to Yahweh's laws. He will choose, for Yahweh your Father will bless you. That, that He'll choose uh, where he chooses to place his name. That's where we keep the feast, at the house of Yahweh. Yahweh is established according to prophecy. He will bless you, of course, and in this way, he blesses you, and he's judging you fit for the kingdom. So the blessings are the opportunity to carry out what we've been taught and practiced. You know, a, a father should teach and train his children by his example. And this is what we see in our Heavenly Father Yahweh. It's what we see in the witness Israel, carrying out and conducting his life according to Yahweh's laws without sin and being quick to repent when we make mistakes. Three times a year, all your males will appear in front of Yahweh, and it outlines the the feast here, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, which is coming up in about a week, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And they must not appear in front of Yahweh empty-handed. So, once again, bringing forth the free will offerings and tithes. You must appoint judges and officers, which we do. And you must follow justice, and only justice, so you will live. It's necessary to conduct Yahweh's feast in this manner. It's, in, it's necessary to conduct our lives in this manner so that we will live. Because as we see in the world today, who has forgotten Yahweh's laws, they're left without direction, without understanding, without hope, or without a real plan to how to overcome these difficulties they're facing. And the difficulties are uh, becoming so in insurmountable and so unaffordable, so expensive, that it's, it's bankrupting uh, whole governments to try to deal with the result of what we would call the curse of sin, but it's the result of sins. Yahweh's, or Yahshua's work uh, did not extend very deep in his time uh, with his people. They kept the Sabbaths, he taught his disciples, but there was many things that they desired to know and understand that he didn't fully explain to them. He was setting up the finishing work for the last days. So there was so much more to Yahshua's work that continues here in the last days that is in uh, that is coupled with or in unity with the work that Yahshua started in his time. Back in Matthew 12, in verse 18, he will bring forth judgment to the, the Gentiles. So this is another prophecy that we're looking forward to seeing fulfilled in this time period. We see in Deuteronomy 12 that there's judgments and laws which we must observe. As we saw back there in verse 66, um, you must be careful to observe and do all these statutes. In verse 69, here in the book of Israel, eighth book of Israel, uh, seven days you'll keep a joyous feast where Yahweh chooses to establish his name. Now in Isaiah 2, we see in the last days here, uh, and this is covered more in more detail in the booklet, The House of Yahweh Established. It's actually a book. Um, And in Isaiah 2, you must do it at the place Yahweh chooses. And of course, as we saw at the temple that Yahweh allowed them to build, it was also destroyed. And of course, Yahshua said, 
you won't be worshiping the Father here that is in Jerusalem at that time here much longer. And this is where Yahshua was speaking to a woman and she was asking him some questions and he was answering her questions. Now, she had a little bit of understanding because she, she was questioning whether or not the work of Yahweh would continue in that geographical region in the future because she had heard some things which got her to thinking that it possibly would change. And this is what Yahshua said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you will, ne will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, not even in Jerusalem. So this is the Savior now doing the speaking. And if you don't believe this part that he spoke here, well, you're going to get lost right here. You might as well give up your, your you know, continued studies if you cannot accept even what the Savior says. I think we all have to make that, I know we all have to make that decision where we're willing to accept Yahweh and Yahshua at their word as being truthful. Because without that, you know, what else is there you can base your life or salvation on? If you can't learn to take Yahshua to have his word, then nothing else will help you. And once again, it's through diligent study of the laws and the prophecies that we come to recognize the validity and the, the, uh, the factual existence of Yahweh. The very last thing that Yahweh requires of this generation is to believe Yahshua. We didn't live with him, and we didn't, he didn't teach us personally, but his writings and the writings of the apostles who saw it and they did experience what he taught and put them down for us in writing, if you study it close enough, you can prove for yourself that these things are true and correct. And it must be for yourself. You're the one that has to live with and answer those thoughts, you know, in your bed at night, thinking on these things, thinking about the meaning and purpose of your life. And remember, as we saw back in verse 63, Yahweh will judge you when you come to the house of Yahweh. That's your opportunity to prove to Yahweh that you will walk in his ways and obey his instructions. And it's what you choose from your own mouth, what comes forth from what you have stored up and put into your heart, what you've uh, valued in your life. And what you bring forth from yourself, that's what you're going to be judged for, not from, for somebody else. You will only answer for yourself. And of course, you know, and, and those that you affect, you know, if, if you teach falsehood and, and bring it forth to others, you're going to end up being like Satan, who is going to be held accountable for the hurt and the harm that she caused others. And, you know, one of the benefits of these classes is that, you know, we break down these details, at least for the teacher, you know, the delivery is challenging, you know, because we have time constraints. But as it says in 1 Corinthians uh, 1, starting in verse 18 through 24, <clears throat> you might want to read that, and it because it it explains how this is going to be brought forth, and it describes it as the foolishness of preaching. You know, we can't pour it into your minds, but it's your effort and your diligent study which is going to convince you.
among some out there, there's uh, talk that, uh, or a question, is Israel Hawkins a false prophet? And a great example that comes to my mind is uh, the prophet Yana, where he was told to go to Nineveh and, and, give, and carry a message. And then, and you can read of that in chapter 3 and verse 9 of Yana, uh, where he recognized that Yahweh relents at times. Yahweh will uh, open understanding or close understanding. And as I got to thinking about that, I thought, well, Pharaoh hardened his heart. But Moshe kept doing his job and giving the warning, just like the witness Israel does today, continuing to do his work and give forth a warning. Noah warned the people while he built the ark. Uh, and I, I thought, you know, I'm not surprised during the building of the ark, whenever a thunderstorm rolled in and it started raining heavy, he probably said to his workers, you know, we got to hurry up and get this thing built. And as the time approached the completion, he probably was telling the people, you know, uh, this might be it, this storm. But we see that it is Yahweh's plan and it's in Yahweh's time. And that is distinct. You know, the fulfillment of a prophecy is distinct from the warning that comes before because Yahweh grants his people the opportunity to repent of their ways and turn to him and receive of his protection. Yahweh is not a, a vengeful being. He's not out to cause harm and destruction, to, to kill people off. He gives ample opportunity to those he allows to be drawn to him. He allows them enough understanding to be able to start taking responsible action in their life. Here in verse 92, Isaiah 28.10, uh, he talks about precept upon precept. Uh, so to bring this lesson to a conclusion, we see that the people of Yahweh in former times went through a period of captivity where they forgot Yahweh. And they were turned to the traditional laws of the Talmud, and they forgot the name of Yahweh, even forgetting their language, their culture, and, and so forth. And then, eventually, the house of Yahweh was completely wiped out and unheard of for since the time of Yahshua, so nearly 2,000 years. But then... In the period of time called the last days, a prophet brought forth these words. And he said, this is the word of Yahweh to Zerubbabel. And we learned from this lesson that Zerubbabel is from two Hebrew mean, words meaning one who opposes Yahweh. And there's a number of other words here brought out in this sermon. One is plummet. Uh, like like a plumb bob that shows true vertical, is a standard of perfection. And so what we see here, and according to this prophecy, we see three features. One, opposing Babylon or a Babylonish land known as the United States today. We see this in prophecy. Two, the establishment of the house of Yahweh and the third feature for this time is that he will finish the work. And this is what we see in the last day's witness who uh, has been part and instrumental in establishing the house of Yahweh in the last days in this time period to bring forth the laws of Yahweh, the standard of perfection, which will go throughout the whole earth and will even gain the attention of the nations. And some of them will respond to this 
uh, and will actually turn and start listening and obeying Yahweh and desiring to keep his feasts. In Zechariah 5.6, in verse 122, and I ask, what is it? And he answered, this is the ephah, the standard of perfection, which is sent by Yahweh's laws. So here we see perfection is realized through the laws of Yahweh, which is a standard of conduct for your life that governs your actions, your interactions with others, and brings peace between you and your neighbors. This is honor, knowledge, and understanding throughout the whole earth. And this is how the house of Yahweh is set apart from the nations. And this is where judgment begins, 1 Kepha uh, 4.17. And so now, you know, it is going to get worse uh, we're already seeing the signs of, of trouble and famine increasing. But here recently with this plague, you know, it's starting to quiet down a bit. It's starting to uh, give people a little breathing room. But it's not time to rest or to slack off because a worse thing is coming because we still do not have repentance. And that's the result of breaking Yahweh's law as the worst thing comes upon you. But we're going to be ready for it and prepared to work through this time period, continuing to preach his message and turn hearts to Yahweh, those who will hear and receive this message. Yahweh, bless your understanding. We're now going to conclude this class. And Yahweh, bless your Sabbath. Our great and awesome name, uh, Father, whose name is Yahweh, this is Kohan Betzalel coming before you as a seed of the witness Israel through a high priest, Yahshua Messiah. We thank you and bless you.